Wealth Hackers, and welcome to another episode of the Truth About Real Estate Investing Show. First of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, for all the listeners. Uh, seems a lot of you like stocks. <laughs> I'm getting minimum three messages a day, some days as many as 10, uh, on people who are, uh, which, and this, the, the response has been completely overwhelming. Uh, we've never had this level of response on any subject or guest in the past. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, please go back to watch, listen to Omar Khan's interview on this podcast. It was released just uh, the previous week. So onto the show. Many of you have been following my Airbnb and stock investing journey, and uh, one has come to a conclusion. I failed in one while the other is prospering. And that is the whole point of this show, is to just be transparent. I find educating, sharing, talking about stuff is just easy to just share truths. Hence the name of the show, The Truth About Real Estate. I've invested roughly $10,000 in each opportunity in the Airbnb and my stock portfolio. Uh, I've actually spent considerably more than $10,000 to get my Airbnb ready to be uh, a short-term rental. And the conclusion is I'm selling my house that I Airbnb'd to free up capital to fund my stock investing account. I've run a test for quite some months. More, I've run, I've, we've been testing Airbnb since June, and I've been doing stocks for close to two months for the first month. It was mostly education and trying to figure stuff out. And then I've been actively trading uh, real money for the last just over a month. So I'm selling that house that I Airbnb'd. And I'm sure you're asking why. Real estate is best, right? The whole show is about real estate. And to quote even myself, monopoly is won by owning, not selling, right? My advice to clients is to not sell unless they have a better opportunity for their capital. And I think I found mine. Now that the summer is over, my projected rental income for my short-term rental has fallen below that of a single-family rental after costs of operation, uh, which are many. Any of you who have a short-term rental know uh, I have many operating expenses. As you can imagine, I have special insurance for a short-term rental. I pay for lawn care, snow removal. Snow removal was a real pain last year because there doesn't seem to be many options. And our snow removal contractor actually stiffed us. They didn't show up over half the time and we didn't get our money back. What are you going to really do? You're going to take someone to small claims court for you know under two grand. There's property management, a well-earned 20%. We have to, we have to pay utilities because it's inclusive and internet. Uh, cleaning costs are a wash as the guests pay for that. In the end, I am extremely overweight in real estate. In real estate, not my body weight. <laughs> and I'm pursuing more cash flow and after doing some reading and studying on the, on the subject and being part of Omar Matthews Stock Hacker Academy and actually doing some trading, I've done uh, already 10 trades or so in this one month. And then seeing a lot of my old real estate friends who are also friends of Matthew and Omar that I knew from other networking groups, as a side hustle, they're earning between 30 to 40% year to date. So to me, I have a lot of green lights to take this stock investing stuff further. It'll be baby steps though. In my first month at the time of this recording, my return on investment is just under 5%, and I've collected 7.6% in cash. Those are gross numbers. They're not annualized. Using this virtually unknown strategy, I'm getting paid to own blue chip stocks at prices I want. I get paid up front too. Uh, my account started with $10,000. So if I click close all my positions right now with a click of a button, I would have almost $500 in my account and just or, no, roughly one month. And understand, I started slow. I did like one trade a week. And then I, I took it a little more aggressively later as I got more comfortable. My goal was 2% a month. Disclaimer time. The past does not project the future. I'm not an expert. I'm not licensed to give advice. This is not advice. Go get advice from experts, as which is always the best advice. And that's not for me. Uh, this is simply me sharing the truth about my real estate investing. My personal truth is I'm earning more cash flow as a percentage of my investment. So ROI or cash yield or cash on cash return. I'm earning more cash on cash with stock investing than I do my Airbnb. And, and then any of you investors go back to the beginning. Why do you invest? For cash flow. It's the original reason I got into real estate. And cash flow will always be your gateway to freedom. I'm not giving up on real estate. My particular situation is we're just selling one of our, one of our a portfolio of 10 properties. Specifically, the house that provides us the least cash flow. And we have a bunch of capital tied up in it. And we can't refinance that house based on our credit situation and the way the market is these days. And this isn't uncommon for... Uh, many investors who, a lot of you guys have been doing this for a while. A lot of you are maxed out on credit as well without having to go to joint venture route. Anyways, this is a personal decision where my goal is to create an additional stream of income. Like my friend Adriano, who we've talked about on this podcast, he's my electrician. He is the same electrician who rewired my house to replace the knob and two wiring in the house I'm selling. And check out what he has to say here. 
Adrian, what do you do for a living? I do electrical. How long have you been in that for? 20 years. So we were talking about stock options at lunch. Yes. Uh, what was life like before stock options? Like, what was work like, vacation like? Uh, work was more of a grind and uh, vacations were one to two a year. Now with stock, op- stock options, they're from four to five a year because I make more money, I can enjoy life. What have, you been, what have you been telling your brother-in-law? So your brother-in-law doesn't do stock options. How come, what do you tell him to do? I tell him to start doing stock options, but he's not on board yet, but he's a real estate investor also like me. And I think he'll, he'll start doing it, but he's just not ready to dabble in it yet. But I tell him to, because I can see all the money I'm making. He's, you know, he's not on board yet though. So you mentioned at lunch, if you started 10 years earlier, what would be the difference? If I would have started 10 years ago, I would have been retired by now, 100%, 100%. And you are already a successful real estate investor and you have a very busy business. Yeah. Uh, what were your retirement plans before stock options? About uh, 20 years out were my retirement goals. Now they're about 10 years, 10 years away, five to 10. It sounds like you're going for a pretty lavish retirement. So. <laughs> five years out, I think that's a manageable goal, don't you think? Based on your income, <laughs> can you share? Please share. Can you share what you can about uh, your stock option returns? So, in my first year trading, I made over a hundred thousand. So, in, on an average, it's been about thirty percent since I started. And then, what kind of financial uh, education did you have before you started doing stock options? No financial education. I'm an electrician by trade. They didn't teach you. Puts and calls and nope. electrician nope. school? No, <laughs> they didn't teach me any of that. No, none of that. No financial background at all. So what do you think, what would you tell someone, like your brother-in-law, for example, who hasn't started doing this? I tell him you should start getting on it. Make some money, extra money, cash flow. If you're interested in learning more, Omar and Matthew, the expert stock investors I'm learning from, their only planned public appearance for the remainder of 2019 is November 9th Wealth Hacker Conference. Many of you who are messaging me three to ten times a day. <laughs> Many of you are asking for more information since their podcast came out, so here I am giving it to you. Go to www.wealthhacker.ca. After you click on the green button that says tickets, there is a promo code hyperlink in the top left. Click on that and enter the word stock. If you can't write this down, you probably want to write this down. With the promo code stock, you save 10% off your ticket price and we will send you an exclusive one-hour training video that was only available to my private iWin membership group. No one outside this group has seen this video until now. This is the first time we've ever made it available. In the video, Adriano, the electrician, shares his experience. And to be honest, Adriano is the one that made myself believe that I could do this too. Omar and Matthew also share how the strategy works as much as they can in one hour. So we get a lot of questions about, can I do what they do after watching one hour or seeing their presentation on November 9th? So the simple answer to that is, if you are prolific in stocks and you already have your 10,000 plus hours of experience, in mastering stocks, you will be able to watch, listen, and walk away being able to practice probably some, and perform similar to the same results as Omar and Matthew. If you're low on stocks and options education and experience like Adriano and myself, you should take a course. Investing in stocks can be very risky. Everyone knows that. It's why I only invest in blue chip stocks that pay dividends. End of the day, I'm, I'm left owning a blue chip stock. And again, this isn't advice. This is just what I'm doing. Like my investments, I like my investments boring. I like my real estate boring as passive as possible and predictable. But I'm honestly very excited to add another six-figure income stream in only 30 minutes a day. I just wish I started sooner. Again, if you want the exclusive one-hour instructional video, go to www.wealthhacker.ca, promo code STOCK, or use the link in the show notes at truthaboutrealestateinvesting.ca. There's a link there that'll take you directly to the discount code, so it's much easier that way. The next live Stock Hacker Academy course will be announced on November 9th at the Wealth Hacker Conference. Those in attendance will get the first crack at the limited number of tickets at the best prices before we offer them to the public. If you're interested in the most effective strategies that you can apply right away that will 10x your wealth in stocks, business, and real estate, you want to be here. November 9th, wealthhacker.ca, promo code STOCK. Promotion ends Sunday, October 6th. On to this week's show. This week's guest is a real estate investor who recently received some media attention east of Toronto. Alex Cormanis is a real estate investor from Toronto, specializing in the wholesale and flipping strategies and markets throughout Ontario. He has been investing for over six years, with the last two years being full-time. In addition to investing, he is an online educator on Udemy and Skillshare, teaching real estate investment, negotiation, and personal finance. He's a nice guy too. Alex also co-hosts the monthly meetup TREIA, 
the Toronto Real Estate Investors Association with his friend and partner, Luke Boyrong. And now I give you Alex. <laughs> but dude, you're famous. I'm famous. I'm in the news. I was you on were, TV. You were on TV for this for the same for the same reason for the same article. No, I, actually, what it was was a couple of years ago they had the um, Scott McGilvery um, Buyers Boot Camp, mm-hmm. and it was kind of funny. So he was looking for um, you know like new in like not really investors, just like a new couple a couple doing their first flip or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you know, I'd like to meet Scott. That'd be cool and see if, you know, he has anything to offer. I'd already, I was already partnering on it with Luke, but I thought, let's just see, you know, what they have to offer. And they didn't really offer anything better than what I was doing with Luke. And I didn't want Luke out of the deal. So I basically just told him, you know, I, I, that's nice, but I don't really need you. So <laughs> they're like, well, we could still have you as like a reject house. So, you know, what's like a problem <laughs> no. that you can say that like Scott wouldn't want to do this deal with? I'm like, well, I have expensive financing. I could just tell him there's a lot of money partners and then he'll be like, ooh, I don't want to touch this. So we just went with that. But it was, uh, that was fun. We did the, did the show and we, <laughs> uh, some some people uh, I know reached out to me and said, hey, you're selling on TV. It's like, yeah, uh, it was fun seeing Scott. We had just had, we just goofed around on that show. It was pretty funny. Too awesome. Yeah, I had, I had friends of mine that were on that show as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you might know you might know Charles and Charles Wan, and Andy Tran, and uh, mm-hmm. Steve Ford. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, the they were on the show. Are, they were on the show. Yeah, yeah. Get they were the reject house as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Like all the houses that were rejected is because they were rejected because they didn't need him. So it's not like <laughs> they were bad deals. It was a uh, uh, so just to give context to that deal, like they bought two houses mm-hmm. and. Then they severed the back, uh, the, the the backyard, and mm. then they built two more houses. So essentially, they had free land to build two more houses and then add basement trees wow. to both of them. So they Get became income properties. You know, someone's Holy famous shit. for the, someone's famous for a show named after that income yeah, properties. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so did they? I don't understand. So would they had just really deep lots that they they divided, or how did that work? Yeah. Yeah, it was a corner lot. They so they bought the corner lot and the house adjacent, the property adjacent. Mm-hmm. So then they essentially had two backyards. Oh, okay. To build to build uh, semi detached homes on it. Wow. And, cool. And they get more rent than I know than anybody. Um, wow. For these new duplexes. Amazing. They're brand new. They built them. They built t- uh, with uh, they. It's much further out of the ground than your typical duplex. Your basement suite. Right. Big windows. Uh, nice finishing. You know. How, like how many duplexes do you see where there's actually a master ensuite, right? They have a master ensuite in a walk-in closet. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's rare. Uh, unless someone doesn't know what they're doing, then you can see that. But it's, it's not often you see someone who has a plan together that's doing that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. So then they're getting, don't quote me, but I think they're getting somewhere around 3500 rent per, per oh, side. Oh, per unit, yeah. per yeah. side. Wow. Per where, side. where are they? St. Catharines. And, in and St. Then, Catharines. Yeah, I oh, know. This is the highest rents I've seen. They were getting like they got like oh, they got a lot for the basement. They got like like fourteen to sixteen hundred for the basements. Jesus. Yeah, that's pretty. And, wild. and this is the house. This is the property they rejected on TV. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, that's not a good enough deal for Scott. No, not a good enough deal. Whatever. Yeah. But yeah, that's no, not point. to disparage anyone. It's just uh, you know, when you don't have the full picture, you don't have the full picture, and you don't have that vision. Yeah. You don't have that vision, then you don't know. Because how many people yeah. would pull off that deal? Not you know, that's a great point. Like that's why there's that saying, you know, deals are uh, not found; they're they're created, they're made, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. with the right knowledge and the right um, perspective, I mean, just as an example, like you know, my like Luke, right, my buddy. I always beef this guy up, but sometimes, man, I don't know how he just sees stuff and pulls it together and makes it work. It's like, oh, okay, that's pretty neat. That's interesting. Like for me, I'm pretty simple. I just bread and butter stuff, simple stuff. I don't like to get complicated. Um, but he tries to find a way to make every deal work. Like he bought one property in a town of like literally like under a thousand people. It must have been like 500 people or something like that, right? It's small. They don't even have like a like a, even like a township or a designated or a stop sign. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. So. Uh, he bought a property there and assigned it and did did good with it. I was like, holy crap! Why would you buy it? It's like hours away. The property is crap. No one's in mm-hmm. that town. What, what mm-hmm. are you gonna do with that deal? Mm-hmm. And he he assigned it anyway. I was like, wow, cool, man. Yeah, it's always cool. neat. It's inspiring. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. 
And then for the for the business benefit, you know, always be careful about what you're what you're taking on. And but Luke's case, he wasn't yeah. actually ever owning it. Am I wrong? No. So what he was going to do was he was going to sever the lot. It was a good sized mm -hmm. lot, and the house was basically useless. Um, but it turned out that there was another buyer um, who was willing to pay, you know, closer to to market. They were looking for a property like this, and Luke happened to connect with an agent out there. I guess he called a couple guys or or connected to him some somehow through the network, mm -hmm. um, and uh, just moved it without having to, to split it up. And he made a, a rate that worked for him. So he's done. I see that you have the millionaire real estate investor just behind your head there. It's a good collection. I have a couple books there. back there. I have a couple books back there. <laughs> you need them. You know, that's the thing. I, I remember I went to, uh, when I got started in real estate, I did the Rich Dad, Poor Dad courses. Mm, okay. And um, What year? The, sorry, what, sorry, what year did you start that, doing that? that? That was, I think I took the course in like 2012 uh, of October. And then I bought my first property in October of the following year. Um, but in the in the first intro weekend, the guy who was doing it was called uh, Pip Stellick. And this guy is just like, he's the man, right? Um, and anybody who knows about the Rich Dad stuff knows Pip. Mm -hmm. So Pip gave us a nice sort of visual where he had a glass of water. And he said, this is your brain. And he holds, holds a jug of water and says, this is you know new information. What you got to do is take this jug, pour it into this glass and pour out all the old stuff and get all the new information to fill up. So that's like your brain. Mm -hmm. And it's totally true. It's like you kind of just have to push out all the bad stuff, replace it with good stuff. And you can't mm -hmm. do that unless you're listening to podcasts, going to meetings, uh, reading books. Uh, there's that saying, too, about how, you know, personal development, that kind of stuff is like bathing. If you do it only once a month, you end up with stinking thinking, you end up stinky, right? Mm -hmm. You want to do that pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what keeps you on track. But it's not do for you, everybody. Do you remember what your bad thoughts were that you need to lose first? Yeah. Um, I think one of the major ones is just the fear of not knowing enough or not knowing you know, what to do. That's always a limiting thing. And that becomes a trap because then you're like, I'll just read the next book or go to the next thing or whatever. And I'll find the, the information, knowledge, whatever I need to get going. And you really can never stop. You, you won't, first of all, stop learning and you can't learn enough to start. You just sort of you get I mean, I guess enough would be read a book, at least like the Millionaire Real Estate Investor or, um, you know, uh, obviously Don Campbell's um, Real Estate Investing in Canada something like that. So at least you have a, an understanding of what you're looking for and how to make that work, some, mm -hmm. some sort of system. Mm -hmm. And then you, you just got to do it because there's no substitute for experience. You know, you can read as many books as you want about riding a bike, but you're not going to get it if you just haven't tried it, right? Right. What a fail. Yeah. And then, uh, not to disparage books, but, you know, some of them were, were written over a decade ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, right? So it's kind of like you can draw some principles, yeah, These yeah, principles yeah. are supposedly universal. They're supposed to apply at any time uh, okay. all over the place. But you're right. I mean, if you read, like, for instance, uh, Think and Grow Rich, it's reasonably antiquated. Like, like I read the unabridged version. And it was like, wow, okay. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. A lot of this stuff you can't really, I mean, not the right way of putting it, really. Kind of off-the-cuff remarks that are, like, not so uh, savory these days. Yeah, and you know, just think of, like, a real estate book. Um, I know you do a lot of uh, letters, but mm -hmm. for example, we talked about Luke, and I know mm -hmm. he does a lot of uh, Google AdWords. Yeah. Right? And there wasn't really Google when these books were written. <laughs> Correct. Correct. And, and you know, the day of, um, oh, God, what's the guy who wrote the book, uh, Zero Down Real Estate Deals? Um, um, he also Ah, he's a big guy. I can't remember his name now. It's somewhere over here. I got the audio books or whatever in a closet and all the other books stacked up. Um, I see him on the gram, but I don't, think that's, I don't think that's what you're looking for. No, it's... Um, anyway, whoever, just one of those, those dudes. And right. it's not that you can't do zero down deals, but there's a difference between doing zero down deals in like 1980 versus 2018, 19, right? Oh, yeah, totally. People are much more aware now and access to information is uh, is there. So... Um, homeowners have a general idea of what the property is worth and they have a general idea of some of the options they have. And if they're stuck, they can kind of wiggle out of them. Not yeah. all of them, of course, which is why, you know, Luke and I are doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's a different time now and, and not everything you want to, you got to want to keep updating and keep trying and, and stay current. You got to be flexible. 
That's mm -hmm. why some businesses fail. They can't they can't be flexible, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you, mm -hmm. and like you mentioned, like you're still using some, you know, I, I was uh, I had some people talking to me about like purple bricks and AI and stuff like that. Like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> right. like, actually, here's a good question for you. Like, of when you're um, for people who respond, people that actually do deals with you from your mm -hmm. letter campaigns. What's like the age demographic? Um, because I, I have my own experience. I'm just curious about yours. Yeah, I would say the range. I think the oldest I did was like someone around 80 or something. Yeah. The youngest I think was probably. So late inter, 30s, late 30s. So I interlude saying, you know, in my experience, it was usually elderly. Oh, so really? I, yeah. So I don't know how. Well, yeah. Oh, sorry. In, in this case, it's usually the, the house has gotten kind of out of, out of hand. Right. Yeah. They can't keep up with the maintenance. Yeah. I mean, and, I, I've, I think that I think it's a, a bit narrower in my case. But what, what, mm, what kind of elderly do you mean? Do you mean like 80s or, or like up or? It's a, I find that it's usually people who uh, aren't tech savvy at all. Mm. Right, we're having to do paperwork the old way. Drive yeah. over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to bring an offer now. You can't, yeah. you can't just oh, yeah. go on uh, DocuSign. I'll get it sent yeah. in two seconds. No, will not happen. Will not happen. Right. Yeah. Fax, not even fax machine. Barely internet. <laughs> barely email. Right, like that. So I don't know how the AI approach would address this market. <laughs> Good point. Correct. There's something right, so to be said for tried and true stuff. Yeah, exactly. And then like, you know, we're, okay, let's bring in blockchain on this too. <laughs> so, yeah, right. So, so we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. But yeah. um, but that's actually what led us to this having booking this this uh, interview mm -hmm. was because you were you were in several publications, were you not? Like um at least one. Uh, there may have been another one as an offshoot, but I haven't I haven't seen that one. I think it was just reprinted on a couple of different uh, sites, like the Quarth the site and then the local Peterborough thing and then some other Maybe some other spots, yeah. Right. So, can you tell listeners what that what the article was about? Um, I mean, it was it wasn't too much exciting. Uh, it, it was basically just more so the the guy was trying to find out what the deal is with me, right? He's like, mm -hmm. "Are you a con artist trying to find elderly <laughs> people who don't don't know how to, don't know how to do uh, anything on the internet and you're swooping out their from un, their house from under them?" Um, and I said, uh, it, "It's pretty simple." there's just people who either cannot or will not go through MLS and they mm -hmm. need an option that otherwise isn't known to them. Um, so oftentimes I like to say we, we keep a bad situation from becoming a disaster. So um, this article was just about like, you know, who is this guy? What is he doing? What does he have to offer? And I, I was surprised because I was very reluctant to speak with this guy. Right. I gave him minimal details and didn't know how he was going to spin it. I said, listen, I'll give you a full interview, whatever you want, as long as I have control over what's printed. And he said, well, I can't do that. And I said, then I can't, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I'll, I'll be, give you a couple of things and be brief. But um, he turned out to write a nice piece about just sort of saying, hey, here's this guy offering this option. And there's also realtors. And they say that, you know what, uh, sometimes it's good to deal with these guys and um, other times good to deal with realtors. And I was like, that's kind of cool. This actually turned out to be, because what, what, what I'm doing and what Luke's doing and actually what you're doing uh, not as common here in the States, right? Like no, uh, um, uh, here in Canada, it is more common in the States. So they're doing yellow letter campaigns there. So I had to explain to this guy, it's, it, you know, it's called, the strategy is called a yellow letter campaign where you just offer handwritten notes to let, um, homeowners know that you're interested in buying. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. So it's kind of a thing that we're, we're sort of setting the tone for, I feel like, uh, because we're doing it on a, on a bigger scale, right? We're like sending out thousands of mailers all over different parts of Ontario. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I'm pretty sure it'll be relatively more commonplace soon, but I guess we were on the scene first, so they they put an article about me. Right, interesting. Because yeah. there was a there was a phase in Burwood and Ron, Ron LeGrand was pushing pushing. Uh, are you familiar with Ron, Ron LeGrand? No. Oh, he's the first person I knew who said yellow letter campaign. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. He's old school. He's old school, eh? Yeah, he's he's like he's like OG. Like his book came out way before Millionaire, Millionaire Real Estate Investor. Ah, okay, that's cool. Yeah. No, it's well, actually funny. Go pick up his book. It's actually hard to find though, because uh, yeah. he's not that active. Uh, it's actually funny though when you read his book, you actually see his content like pretty much everywhere. <laughs> uh, what's what's it called? Can you spell it for me? Uh, Ron Legrand, R O N uh, Legrand, L E G R A N D, and uh, Ron Legrand. It's actually a very good book. 
like especially like for like when you when you run into people that want to say hey Alex I want to do what you're doing like this is a really good book to give them okay that's great that's I appreciate that because I get that a lot of times and it's like I'm pretty much useless I don't know what to tell like people always ask that 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 question where they're like what's the best thing to invest in or what's the best investment or what's the best it's like dude, all I yeah, yeah number one yourself for sure put the put the investment there um, but uh, apart from that is it's sort of like a spiritual journey you got to figure out what you want your life to look like and then reverse engineer I can't tell you that it's so tough can... though because there's so many things that are being taught out there and you don't know what the right answer is that yeah because you're cause, uh, you know you talked about million millionaire state millionaire real estate investor mm -hmm. um, Gary Keller wrote, wrote a really good book as well called uh, that one thing okay right? I think I heard of that one yeah what was that one about is that one thing? <laughs> the, oh, the one thing that you're like good at, and then you double down or triple down. Is that what it was? Like uh, no, more about figure out what that one thing that you should be focusing. Oh, on. that you should be focusing on. Yeah, that you should be doing. Right. That's right. I actually didn't even read the book, but that concept, just that sentence, mm -hmm. like fired off a light. Yeah, that's the one I saw. Yeah, okay, great. I'll get that one. Thanks. I, I don't even know where you get it from. Let me actually check what year I think it was published. Can... I think you can get it on. Uh, it says this on Google Books. It might be on. It might be on Amazon. You used to give you give this for free. Oh yeah. Two thousand four published. Cool. No, yeah, when you uh, yeah, like I said, when you talk to beginners, if you um, that's, that's something I love. I like to do is when a beginner reaches out to me, I usually offer I offer them knowledge of what books to start with. And yeah, it's something like your path. Cool. This is a good. For the for what I know of your path, this is a good one. It okay. even talks about like private lending. Um, Great, that's the importance cool. of getting your own private lending. Uh, like I mentioned, he's the first person I've ever, I've ever heard say yellow letters, and I'm pretty sure he's got a copy of his own in here. Oh, okay, cool. There's also, by the way, for any listeners, uh, Michael Corals. If you go to, I think it's yellowletters.com or michaelcorals.com or something like that. He has like a whole thing laid out about how he does it what he sends out and the different kinds of paper and all this kind of craziness. So that might be overkill, but there's a lot of information there. And I just sort of, that's what I tell people too. It's like, well, what do you do for yellows? I'm like, just go to, what I learned, I got from that. So just go on there and figure it out. Excellent. Like, yeah, because yeah. like, you see like sample, flyer. Yeah, perfect. I buy houses, any yeah. area, any condition. Yeah, yeah. you know, like, like again, this is the first person I knew who was teaching this stuff. You know, sample business card. Telephone questionnaire for buyers. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. old school. Printed twenty two thousand four. <laughs> it looks a little thin too, which is nice. I hate books that are not unnecessarily dense. Well, it's a little bigger, right? Like, how, you know, oh, I, I have a pretty big face, wider, but actually. yeah, it's big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's a good one. That's a good one. But, uh, but yeah, I remember reading your article, and it, it sounded very, pretty balanced. Which is, yeah, that's uh, uh, a good. You know, it, I said I'm impressed that you were. Um, you know, when someone, someone from the media reaches out to me, I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just um, part of it is my sensitivity to, you know, where things are these days. Um, don't want to get into that because we'll get off topic. But, you know, I, I'm a little wary to give information that I can't control because I don't know how it's going to be spun. Mm -hmm. Right. So especially mm -hmm. when you have the media, I mean. I, I basically said, you know, I, I don't know what your agenda is. He's like, well, there's no agenda. I'm like, that's someone who has an agenda, what they would say. You know, like, I, <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're going to print. I don't have any control. I can't. Sorry. Yeah. So just uh, maybe I'm paranoid, but um, yeah. I know what you mean, though. It's, it's, it's kind of nice when someone reaches out to you and says, hey, I'd like to have a conversation with you and mm -hmm. report to everybody what, what we talked about. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, that's nice. I can talk about myself. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, yeah you, know, you, 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 you weren't apprehensive about having this call. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you, and uh, if I look bad, I, I know where to find you. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, just to give some context to why I think it, you, were, you were wise to uh, be concerned about how you would be portrayed in, in the media, is I, I have friends who are portrayed poorly. Oh, know? yeah, yeah, I have friends who are like apartment building owners, and then mm. like here comes the rent strike, or the you know. I know. You know, it's kind of the funny thing. I always, so you took like the personality profile stuff, right? Like the Myers-Briggs and all that stuff. 
Mm -hmm. So I think mine is the campaigner. I don't remember what the things, I think it's like ENFP or ENIG or something like that. So my tendency is to like promote and to share and to celebrate and to do all these things mm. um, and to encourage people and lift them up. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, well, I mean, you're, you're in, I think you're probably in the same boat, right? That's what you're doing with this podcast. So, um, and by the way, I love that you're doing that with the podcast. Um, I also did uh, uh, the one with uh, the right club. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool that you guys are taking, I mean, you're, obviously you're benefiting, but you're taking the time and you're doing it to really give back. And it's no small feat. I, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with that. So that's pretty cool. Um, but what were we talking about before? Oh yeah. Like your buddies are being misrepresented. Like I used to be that kind of guy that lift everybody up or whatever, but I'm finding these days I'm posting stuff on Facebook to lift people up and people jump in to say how it's bad. And I'm like, I, I, I didn't say that. You're saying I'm implying that, but I'm just focusing on getting people to a better place. That doesn't mean they're not enough. It doesn't mean being poor is bad. It's just the money is important. <laughs> Go get some of it. You can do it and you get torn down. So these guys are like, so what's been going on? Like, they're like, oh, look at these landlords that uh, are increasing the rents. How rotten. It's like, yeah, I'm how providing. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, how rotten that we can, so we can afford, you know, to pay the hydro bill <laughs> yeah. to afford the property tax that went up. Like yeah, people so, don't, so horrible. People want everything. Yeah, exactly. Property taxes right. are going up. You've got uh, um, capital expenditure that you got to deal with, a new boiler, new roof, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and and you've got li liability and risk and dealing with bad vacancy and all this crap. Like people don't know what it is to be an investor. And it's kind of shocking that it's like, same old story, right? Like I remember when I was bartending, People had like no respect for this guy's. I'm like this, this guy <laughs> built this restaurant. He's probably losing money all the time, and he's here 16 hours a day. Can you just stay off your phone? Like, can you just do your job? Mm -hmm. Like, they, they just take it as a given that well, someone's gonna build a building, they make money, and they're gonna give me a job. I'm out a job. It's like somebody has to create that for you. Mm -hmm. Like, I, it's it's mind boggling. Same thing with housing. Like, if you want a slumlord, what you should do is have rent controls. And um, yeah. um, stringent requirements because they're gonna have to. They're gonna be forced to squeeze everything. They're gonna create substantial rentals because they're not right. making a profit. That you know. Anyway, right. I'm all fired up now. <laughs> uh, that there is, I think, is the is the problem. Is because I think people are have self serving interests first. Yeah. Right. Because if you yeah. think about how rent control worked out, even when the PCs passed it, where okay, 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 we all have rent control. Yeah. Everybody else, they're all, don't worry about them. That's their problem. <laughs> Right, yeah. and it's everywhere. Like you even yeah. see with like unions, for example. Yeah. Like okay, okay. Uh, take any trade, for example. Okay, everybody here, we're all grandfathered in. Yeah. Anyone else? They have all these requirements they have to go through. Yeah. To become 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 part of our union. Get get the trade designation. All those of things. Right. It's really kind of funny <laughs> because it's almost like. I mean, everybody likes to talk about the matrix. You know, this is the matrix, and like, yeah, that's kind of cliche, but it is a useful analogy. The perception of it, it's so actually, you know, what was really an eye opener. I, I'm a pretty big fan of Kiyosaki. I respect mm -hmm. him because, hey, Ken, what's going on? Um, <laughs> Ken Beckenham, ladies and gentlemen. Kiyosaki. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Kiyosaki, sorry. So Kiyos oh, yeah, you told me not to look. <laughs> All right, Kiyosaki. Um, he, he basically lays out side by side. He's like, this is the poor, this is the rich. And their beliefs are almost always exactly opposite. The whole way down like you know having money is bad no having money is good yeah. um uh you should be able to to charge for value you should be able to give value it's like or you should be able to you know offer value for free or something like that it's like mm -hmm. you can bring value but charge for it that's okay you can't just give your value because then you die and then you can't help anybody like <laughs> mm -hmm. it's just it's just radically different and uh the perspective is that hey the government should come in and help us and take care of us they're the only ones that are consistently unreliable and constantly screwing you to line their pockets of themselves and their friends. Why? Like you should try to bridge the gap and be friends with your business owner, like your boss and, and friends mm -hmm. with your landlord and try and find a way to support them. And that way that'll make things easier on you. But instead you put up a fight, you vote for people who don't care about you and it makes the system sticky. It's like, anyway. Right. right. Which is why uh, when Kiyosaki wrote about in Rich Dad Poor Dad about how you should um, have a business so that when you pay less tax and you have more control of what you do with your money, you can give it to charity, 
exactly you can in your business you can hire more employees exactly right? things like that you can you can implement change without government assistance and often exactly. more efficiently correct right? like for example like an example i have is like our charity has almost virtually no overhead right amazing versus if you think if that was the gov if, if the government was operating the exact same operation we would glass building yeah. lined with gold pension yeah, charity right Pen you know, yeah yeah you know, we'd have to pay someone for life. <laughs> crazy. Right? We couldn't afford to operate. I mean, In fact, just... you know, the, now that you mentioned something uh, about Kiyosaki and that thing, I think he was one of the first guys who pointed out the, um, it wasn't the law of reciprocity, but something along that lines where I think it was like um, stewardship or tithing or something like that. And he says, you got to give, um, you got to just give and it will come back. Uh, and he makes that point many times. And, you know, my background is in uh, philosophy and cognitive science in school. So I appreciate Kiyosaki for his philosophy and the way he just really dilutes complex material in just a couple of sentences or a paragraph. And it's just so powerful that you don't even actually notice it's important information mm -hmm. until it comes up and you're like, oh, I, that's what he was talking about. Or, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, oh, I'm derailed now. Uh, about Kiyosaki. Um, I don't know. I think that, that thought's gone. I just respect his, uh, his approach. And, oh, I, I guess, no, what it was was being critical of the notion that there's some sort of, let's say, karmic alignment or karmic force out there that is working for you. Like, back in the day, I would have been a lot more of a materialist, you know, a lot more physics-based or science or math or whatever, and then with philosophy, just sort of poo-pooing all these kinds of things. But the funny thing is, is that with those, you know, getting involved in the sciences and getting involved in math, what you look for is overlap. Because when you see overlap in different fields, that's an indication that they're pointing in the right direction. Something that keeps popping up in these different disciplines, that means we're on the right path. So that's what you see in these personal development books. And giving and tithing was is, is a consistent theme. And by God, somehow it just always works out. You don't give to receive, but often when you do, you, you do receive. It's, Mm -hmm. Not crazy. Mm -hmm. Leave with value. Yeah. Actually, that's such a good segue. Uh, mm -hmm. What what value are you giving when you're doing these letter campaigns? So, Actually, there's a copy of it in the article. So anyone who, oh, that's right. gee, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, uh, so for listeners of the podcast, we'll have we'll have the notes. We'll have. Oh, I'll try to post this somewhere. <laughs> Okay. I'll post the link to the article because I was going to tell people to Google your name. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> um, yeah. Alex is Greek. Is that a Greek last name? It is, yeah. It, Coromanic. <laughs> my dad's Greek. My mom's English. So we have the two major uh, dominating forces in the world, you know, that wants to just take over everybody and convert them. You know? Actually, the Greeks are pretty lazy. The English are the, are the imperialists. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you're, um, can, you, can you say, can, what, what is it about your letter campaign that works? Because in my, um, so my experience is it's, it hasn't done, my, uh, my letter campaigns didn't do well. Mm. Um, so what do you think that's good about yours? Well, there's, the, the real ticket is to do different kinds of things that get you different results that you can mm. pull together. Because if you just stick with one major routine, I mean, I do, I do like mailers, they, I like them better for who I am and I like face to face stuff. I'm not mm -hmm. too crazy about the internet stuff. And as we discussed before we got this thing together, I was struggling with these AirPods trying to get them linked to my devices. I couldn't figure it out. So I'm not too tech savvy, but I do have, mm -hmm. I, I do have a website. I'll get another one. But anyway, what was working with the, the letter campaigns? I'm not really sure. I think it was just um, visually simple to read. Um, I mentioned in there that, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll, I, I mentioned some pressure points that I alleviate, right? So I'm going to take care of your lawyer for you, even though that doesn't matter. I'll pay your lawyer, any lawyer you want. It shows a bit of you know, trust, like we're going to do lawyers, no problem. I'll pay for it. Um, in any house, any condition, we don't have to deal with realtors. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. Um, I think, I don't know. Your penmanship's quite I'm good. Not sure. Actually, it's my talking? wife. Because my, <laughs> my penmanship is atrocious. Like I should have been a doctor just to write notes people can't read. Um, but yeah, my wife, I had, I had her write it. She's, uh, she's a lot more talented than I am with, with, you know, design. 
But anyway, um, the, just, I don't know, maybe because it looks a little bit different from most mailers, because a lot of what people do is they'll say, hi, my name is so-and-so, I'd like to buy your house, and it's just like a little note. And mine has a little bit more visual aids. It's got like check marks in it. Um, uh, the font is nicer to look at, it's clean. Um, it's a nice small card, good feel. And um, I think the real ticket though is just letters just seem to, they just seem to be something that get people to open up. They feel like it's a personal gift, you know, like someone took the time to write me a letter. And I always let them know, hey, um, I didn't write that one to you specifically. There was an original copy that was reprinted by the thousands. So you just received one in the mail. And then we have like a little laugh about that. But um, to answer your question from before, uh, the value that I bring, it, it, everybody's got different situation, different circumstances. Generally, though, um, the value that I bring is a convenience. It's just when you do a deal with me, it's done. You can leave your stuff. You can take your stuff. We can close when you want. I got the realtor or the uh, lawyer covered. We don't have to deal with realtors. We don't have to deal with showings. And um, the question that I get a lot of times is like, well, why would someone, you know, leave money on the table just for those things? It's like they at, at that point, for whatever it is that they're going through, they simply just can't or won't deal with going for the higher price. They're just going to deal with me. And really what it is, is over the phone, you make a little bit of a connection. And if you're the kind of person, I think if you're just the kind of person that, that that's service oriented and gives people value, that comes across in a conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're really listening to people's pain and you're trying to, you know, figure out how to help them. And a lot of times it's very, it's, it's, uh, it's sad. I've, I've been like in situations where I get a little teary. I can't help it. It's like, man, that's rotten. I hate that. That's happened to this person. So you know, um, the value is that the deal is there's no more pain anymore. I'm here. I'll take care of it for you. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give you the price that works for you, right? Like this is what works for me. Does that work for you? Yes. Perfect. Cause obviously they're not going to list, they're not going to clean it up and list it and wait for months for the right offer and all this kind of stuff. They just want it done. Mm -hmm. Um, quick closing, um, flexible. It's just a, the, it's a service and, mm -hmm. um, it's something other than dealing with the headache of realtors. Cause it's not that right. all realtors are bad, but that's a common pain point for people that like just don't want to deal with realtors i've had bad experiences it's like yeah. okay yeah deal with us. and some people don't want to sh have still pride they may not want to show their property in the condition it's in correct they and they don't want the neighborhood sometimes aware of the fact that they're selling they just want to slip away in the night like so one one deal that i did i think it's still my favorite deal is a really great one it was on um uh near bathurst in toronto and um the owners uh i think were in their early 60s um, and they just uh, they've had past traumas and they've had you know difficult lives or whatever but they had this beautiful property and obviously it's full of stuff and they they and and things are like ceilings falling down backyard is just not walkable uh, <laughs> uh, it stinks and um, they just have no point of commencement they just don't even know where to start with this and they're like I, you know what the bank told me I've got like, you know, a week or something like that. And then they're going to start a uh, foreclosure or, uh, you know, they're going to get a rear possession or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they got no choice. I just sort of go, okay, I'll advance you 50 grand. I'll register it against the property. So this one that I did in Bathurst, what I did, I said, uh, uh, I'll give you 50 grand. You can pay back some of the uh, pressing uh, loans that have been put off for a while, property taxes, whatever you want to do. Um, and it'll give you some money to uh, get yourself prepared to move. Um, and um, I can't offer you what the realtor can offer you, um, but it's, you know, it's okay. It's close. And does that work for you? And she's just like, yeah, you know what? The amount that you gave me, that works for me. I'm aware I'm leaving uh, like 100K or whatever on the table, um, which, you know, obviously if you're going to do a flip, uh, you got to, <laughs> if you're borrowing money, 10% uh, or whatever, you need some, you need some buffers there. So um, yeah, she just sort of accepted it. Um, it was her and her, her partner. And um, I gave them the convenience. I gave them a way out. I relieved their pain. And um, their their realtor, who was their friend, wouldn't offer them that. And when they told them that, you know, they they wanted to entertain my offer, the realtor got mad at them. This is their supposed friend, you know. It's not, again, that's not all realtors, but that was the case there, and that's common. So mm -hmm. she was happy to leave the money on the table and, and help me because I helped her. All right. Whenever there's money involved, feelings can do can get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Understandably, I, I get it. You know, again, like you're saying, I like that you were saying before, not to disparage anybody, but it, it happens. 
So you mentioned uh, you mentioned like ten percent. So what? The bank is charging you ten percent? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I do private uh, money most of the time. I used to mm -hmm. be a bartender, and that was hard enough getting a bank loan. Um, now that I'm unemployed, or actually, I like to say unemployable because I can't do what people tell me to do anymore. Um, I got to go the private route. So what you do is you go to regular meetups um, and different kinds of meetups. You go all over the place and you find a way to stand out, get attention and connect with people. And if they like you um, and they are confident in you, then um, you just sort of say, you know, how, how's your RSPs doing or how are your mutual funds doing? Or, or you know, uh, have you invested in real estate before? Okay, what'd you get before? Okay, 8% is pretty good. How'd you like 10? You know, and like, yeah, 10, we can do that. <laughs> um, and just slowly build up these private lenders over time or mm -hmm. um, work with brokers who can always get you like 9% with, you know, between two and 3% um, for in fees, including mm -hmm. the lender's fee, the um, uh, realtor, uh, sorry, broker fee and whatever else. Um, so it works out roughly to be about 10% and overall uh, most of the time. That's very cool. Uh, yeah. For the listeners benefit, that's actually very common is, uh, people like Alex do not go to the banks for short-term financing because how long do you need that money for? Um, usually it'll take about four to six weeks for a, a flip. And then, um, that's quick, dude. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I mean, it depends on who your team is. Um, some guys can do it. Some guys do it quicker. I actually heard this one guy, um, it depends what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, it depends what they're doing. But but what he did was he has like a lot of people and he staggers them and mm -hmm. they speak different languages so they don't communicate and he just bangs up places super quick. But like I don't know, most likely I don't know. I don't think he's doing everything that he could. But um anyway. Um yeah, so I would say the money is for about six months, four to six months, something like that. And the ten percent is the that's an annualized number? Correct. So ten percent is per annum and we'll pay them for the duration of the loan, which uh, we usually like to be flexible, but we'll say, you know, depending on the project, we can be reasonably confident about our timeline and mm -hmm. offer, you know, like, let's say, so that works out to this amount. Does that work for you? And they'll mm -hmm. say, yep, sign me up. Mm -hmm. cool. Do you hold any property? You still hold, yep. you hold some properties, are you not? I did, I did hold uh, a, a couple, um, but I mostly divested. I've got one duplex in Barrie, and I'm going to probably sell that one um, because it's been a hassle. Um, what I've done is I purchased a, an 11 unit building in Peterborough. So that's kind of my first larger scale um, hold. And mm -hmm. um, it's actually mixed use, so it's commercial as well, which I don't really know too much about, but you know what, we'll figure it out. Um, so that I am holding because the numbers make too much sense. Um, mm -hmm. But most of the time, because I don't have a career, um, I, I offload my, my uh, inventory to just get um, profit. And then mm -hmm. I reinvest it into solid investments like this 11 unit building I got. Very cool. Is that mm -hmm. private money as well? Because mixed use yeah. is usually at least B lender or creative lender. 100%. So in this case with this guy, it was, and again, this is one that'll move you to tears, right? This is a sad story. So the guy who owns the place, super, super nice guy, probably like in his 60s and church going guy. Uh, not that that necessarily means anything, but you know, he, you know, he's he's uh, on a, a path of you know goodness and he's always trying to help and, and he follows the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And um, he's always been charitable to people. And his wife got sick. Uh, she had an issue with, I think her kidney and he donated his kidney to help her out, but there's only a certain amount of life on that. So she's like kind of on her last legs and he was retiring and he just wanted to leave. So I said, look, um, this is what I can offer you. Um, but obviously this building, the way it is, it's going to be damn near impossible for you to finance this thing. So mm -hmm. are you open to um, helping us out with financing? And he said, yes. And I said, okay. Um, you know, again, it's kind of a high purchase price. So for the property, it's a century old home. There was literally like drug users in it at one point and just all like tenant profile was just not great. And like about a third of the market rent. So, I'm like, you're gonna have to give me 0%. Um, I mean, we, I didn't say that. I said something like, you know, does 0% work? And uh, he said, yeah. He pretty much said yes to everything, right? So I wasn't expecting 0%, but he took it. So, okay, cool. Yeah, 0%. Uh, and uh, the rest of it. like you took over a gym here. <laughs> well, exactly, right? I mean, what the hell? You took over a project. I'm taking a problem, big time. A scary one, right? 
So druggies? <laughs> yes. Yeah, man. It's, it's it's wild. It's wild. Like one unit we cleaned out had uh like actually drug paraphernalia in it, and it was like there was like a kid's room and all this kind of stuff. And it's not I mean, this is the reality of real estate. It's not all uh top hats and cigars and monocles, you know what I mean? It's like mm -hmm. real lives here. And um, so anyway, then that building is just whack. It's just <laughs> like so many things I gotta deal with. Well, it's such so, a home. Very yeah, different construction. Codes back then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he did uh, enough to keep it current, but um, that was like 20 years ago. So there's, you know, deferred maintenance and all these other things I got to deal with, right? Um, but the rest of the money, the balance of it, uh, one guy uh, who I, I connected with through um, a guy who's going to be my partner on the deal uh, had 200k in, I think, mutual funds or something like that. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know, uh, mutual funds are stinky. How'd you like 10%? He said, yeah, sure. Uh, but I need to secure it, right? So um, uh, we we offered him a second position, uh, which got him up to roughly 80% of the full loan to value of the property. Uh, we, bought the, we brought the remaining 20% through uh, three private lenders. Uh, and the the rest, the closing and the renovation is all going to be uh, our, our cash contribution. Mm -hmm. So we have our skin in the game. Busy, busy. Yeah. I'm not uh, quite at that point yet where I can just borrow everything. You know, you need like an extensive portfolio of like 100 mm -hmm. unit building, 20 unit building, 50 unit building. I just, I'm at the 11 in the duplex. So <laughs> like, I don't really have much was, to show at this point. Was that a letter uh, that got you that Actually, got to that lead as well? It was, it was, but the property was listed. So um, what I found out was that the listing was exclusive. Mm -hmm. And they were asking like a ridiculous amount of money. I think they were asking like 1.5. Property mm -hmm. wasn't really worth. Uh, I I got it at 1.8 8. Uh, sorry, uh, 1.80. So 1.1 less 20k. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I pretty much, I may have gotten about a 100k discount or so, maybe. Um, either that or it's about market. It's tough to say. There's not really too much data to run with over there, but um. Uh, the buildings that are up and running the way they should uh, for that area are selling for like 1.7, 1.8, stuff like that. So we know there's a lot of room to go on that one. A lot of work too, it sounds. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a buttload of work, man. Like Have this you one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Ah, uh, uh, nothing. Just all the floors are all screwy, and my partner, uh, my guy who was <laughs> going to be a partner, was like, "Ah, don't worry about it. All of them are screwy." I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to be like every other rental in Peterborough. This is going to be the, the one of the most beautiful units on a budget, and we're going to offer value because you got. So Peterborough is interesting, right? Like they've got um, the prices are starting to kick up a little bit because obviously the ripple effect, right, out from Oshawa and Peterborough is on a lot of investors' uh, radars now. So the the old school guys that are there that have all their buildings, um, they don't put a dime into them and they just crank up the rents like crazy. Like there's apartments being rented for like, uh, like one bedroom is being rented for like twelve and $1,400 and they're, and they're crap because they can. There's just the inventory is tight and the population is, is growing. I, I, I mostly due to the universities. So the student rental thing is big. Um, and yeah, landlords aren't motivated to to spend money. They they they're of the old school Peterborough, which is this kind of rougher patch of uh, area. And I'm seeing the opportunity, which is you know there's there's money to be made here, and we can offer value and separate ourselves from the competition and make sure that we get the cream of the crop, right? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So wait, so wait, sorry. How did you find the deal then? Did you oh, see sorry, the exclusive so listing, or did your mailer go to his home? So he or actually went to the building and he picked it up. <laughs> he received the mailer in his home, which was nearby. Uh, and he okay. called me uh, saying, hey, uh, I've got a property that's listed, which when I get I get calls like that all the time. And normally it's like, oh, God, okay. uh, all right. Why isn't it selling? You know, what's the issue? Oh, thanks. thanks. Obviously, right? <laughs> most of the time, most of the time. I want two million dollars. The, the, the property down the road's over two million dollars. Like, yeah, because it's a castle and there's the shack. What do you want? Right? Yeah. But um, anyway, in this case, it just happened to be that they overpriced it and um, there was someone interested, but they didn't pull a trigger and we got a reduced rate because of that in part. Uh, and I also was able to get a VTB at 0%. So that's really what changed it, I think. Mm -hmm. That's what made it viable. So when you got no, no, when you negotiated the VTB, uh, mm -hmm. you, 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 you counted the story as you were talking to the seller directly. 
the, the agent. No, I was talking. To, I was talking to the agent. Yeah, like it was like, hey, and I, he got it done. He did. You know what? To be honest, he relayed the message, and like every time I asked the agent for something, <laughs> he was like, well, I don't know, you know. And they went to see. He's like, okay, yeah. He said yes. It's like, really? He's like, yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I know it's a challenge. Everyone's afraid. Everyone's afraid yeah. of liability too. And then a lot of you know, a lot of you probably got a, you probably got an actual uh, commercial agent. So, so they actually knew this is uh, a requirement of getting the deal done. Yeah, he he knew at least enough to know that. Uh, yeah. He I'm not he didn't strike me as like the veteran of Peterborough, like the guy that everybody goes to. He he mm-hmm. was just a broker, right. and um, uh, yeah, um, I think that it was listed for for I think it was listed for a few months. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they had an offer that fell through. I think they were just starting to realize, you know, hey, there's a there's a problem. I mean, the real problem was, like I said, right, the, the tenant profile was pretty crap and the mm-hmm. rent was super low and no one wants to, like, deal with that because that's like, what are you going to do? Right. How are you going to are you, you going to guarantee you're going to get them out? Right. But just so happened that we made the conditional period, I think, like 60 days, <laughs> which is not unusual for uh you know largest yeah. family family but yeah. after 60 days literally like half the tenant profile left they, they they were like well here's the offer um i'm selling to this guy and then they just started moving out or one guy got evicted um one person disappeared uh one person was going to move uh, a couple others were planning on moving but closer to august so at the time they had that other offer that wasn't on the table uh and then uh so now i'm pretty much down to three of the original tenants. One, I'm gonna move into my student rental uh, that I'm gonna do there. Uh, and uh, the others I still have to figure out. And they're a little tricky. So I'm not really sure what's gonna happen, but um, it just sort of seems like money is usually the answer. So I'll just find out what they want and um, help them relocate. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Now I have a question about wholesaling, because actually mm-hmm. I don't even know the answer to this. Okay. When you're wholesaling a deal, what is your agreement with the with the seller? Um, what do you mean? Uh, like, how long do you have to sign the deal? I usually will give it conditional on ten business days. Again, it's one of those things that you know, like I <laughs> that one that I did on uh, Bathurst. The deposit was one dollar, and it was conditional. <laughs> so you go tell realtors in Toronto, hey, um, this guy bought a property with a dollar deposit with conditions. It's like. That's impossible. No, it's not. Just get realtors out of the way and then it's possible. <laughs> so I just asked for that and they were agreeable to it because to me, I was like their hero, right? They were like, you know what? This guy is going to get it done. He's going to give us some money to solve our problems. We're going to get out of here. Whatever he wants. Fine. 10 business days. Doesn't matter. He's going to buy it. Who cares? So I have usually like, let's say two weeks roughly to assign a property without um, having to go firm. But normally the way I do it is I'll, I'll run my numbers so that if I couldn't assign it, I could just flip it, right? Because then it doesn't really matter. And sometimes, like when we got started, uh, I think we, I, when I got started, I was looking for deals off MLS. And in that mm-hmm. case, most of the time it had to be, you know, firm offer. So that's kind of where I got that habit from, I think. It was just like, just make it so that if you would buy this property, flip it, then you can do that, but try to assign it first. And then mm-hmm. the assignments just became easier and um, that then flipping for me because you know you got a time component there, mm-hmm. you've got uh, um, you know some element of risk, you got to tap cash and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Not that it's easier per se than flipping. Like you have to flip in order to wholesale because you need to know mm-hmm. what to look for and how to get stuff mm-hmm. under contract and what you got to do, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, I have more questions though. <laughs> okay, fire away. Do you have uh, employees? Do you have contractors under uh, that are T4 or anything like that? No, I don't have like any salaried employees. I, mm-hmm. I, I haven't done enough flips to do that. Um, mostly there were guys that worked with other investors I knew. So Luke, I borrowed his team. Um, Luke actually took care of a what was called a wholetail that we did in Midland where he just basically, I, I, didn't, I didn't really want to deal with it. And uh, uh, for like at the time, I think I paid him like... Uh, five or eight grand or something like that. And he just called up a couple of people to do basic work. And he had some people actually in the area because he had a cottage up there. Mm-hmm. So I had him, you know, basically manage it for me. I wasn't going to go up that area. He was, he knew a couple of people in the area and he just took care of it for me. Um, other times I'll just hire contractors that make sense to me. Uh, in this case, um, 
with the 11 unit building, again, uh, it was a referral from another investor. That's usually how I like to do it. I don't like to just sort of call Kijiji or, or you know, see how that works out. I like to get realtor refer, uh, uh, real estate investor referrals, but some real estate investors are gonna have these guys salaried, so you can't use them, um, but not everybody does that. So uh, yeah, I, I just uh, get guys, pay them on, on a job per basis. Cause I, again, am sliding more towards wholesaling than flipping. So I don't have regular work for these guys. Um, I'm more interested in just raising the capital so I can buy cash flowing buildings like the one in Peterborough. So um, it's actually, you know, actually you get, you just reminded me, um, the E-Myth. Um, have you read the E-Myth? You know the E-Myth yes. obviously? Okay, yeah. so for anybody who hasn't read the E-Myth, great book, go buy it, read it, it's amazing. Uh, one of the key takeaways in there is that your business is essentially a, a momentum, right? You're either gonna go backwards or you're gonna go forwards. You can't stand still and maintain. Um, so I, I am at the point now where I kind of need to get employees because I'm really busy with the 11 unit building and I can't be answering calls and looking at properties and you know, making contracts and whatever when I got to deal with other stuff over here, I just scattered. So I am entertaining the idea of looking for employees. I kind of, the way I've been doing it so far though is having people that are interested in real estate investment and then having them take care of things for me. Um, and then they get to learn and I get to, to free up my time a little bit, but mostly it's just been me. So to answer your question, I don't really have employees per se. Um, and with contractors, whatever, I just hire them on a mm -hmm. job by job basis through referrals from other investors. Do you have an assistant yet? No, I should get one. I just, like, <laughs> it's chaos right now. I've got like papers all over the place. So I really mm -hmm. should get one. I just, uh, I'm a little reluctant. I'm, I'm just trying to keep it simple and small because I ultimately don't want to build so here's me, okay? And I think this is why I like your podcast is because what you're trying to do is help regular people make their lives better and help their families out, right? I think it's probably a crude way of putting it, but you're providing the tools essentially. And um, my tool to offer is if you could be like a boneheaded bartender and put deals together, I mean, anybody can do it. Um, and I, I've, I've, never really been too keen on being a like business mogul or um you know have a company that goes public and i trade stocks and like that's kiyosaki's whole deal that's not my deal i i just want um you know let's say around 100 units or so um just and, units. yeah <laughs> just, yeah i mean that seems to be that spot that you're going to be the safest and make the most money Mm -hmm. um, so at the hundred unit mark, um, my wife and I'll be taken care of. I'll be able to take care of my parents, probably my in-laws as well, um, and raise a family and have time for them. Speaking of which, hello. Got my hey, dog Jim. and my wife here. No, it's, uh, I got a Shiba. <laughs> hey, Mac, who's this guy? Who's this guy? Oh, you're too. <laughs> He's a little devil. Oh, sorry for anyone who's listening and doesn't see the video. Oh, the video. You can check out the video on YouTube that's, or my Facebook uh, for the live video. But uh, that's Alex's dog. <laughs> her name is Max Ashiva. You can follow her on Instagram and all her hilarious antics, which is usually sleeping and uh, playing around with other dogs, I guess. I don't know. Um, anyway, that's that's my motivation right there. That's my why uh, is my, my wife, dog. My, my, oh. dog. <laughs> no, my family, my wife, my dog, um, you know, kids eventually. And um, I, I just want to be busy managing buildings um, yeah. or managing managers of buildings. I don't yeah. really want to continue building a massive business of wholesaling and flipping and all that kind of stuff. It's just not, it doesn't turn me on. Um, I'm just curious. I like to enjoy life and experience things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to keep it relatively small, but like you're pointing out, I guess, is that I, I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed with just too much and I really need someone. I'm just so busy that I have days where I'm like, I don't have anything to do, but it's filled and I can never catch up. So. I'm pretty sure at some point that's going to catch up with me. I'll be in trouble. So I probably need to get someone. There's that saying, if you don't have an assistant, then you are the assistant. <laughs> exactly. And that's the thing, man. I mean, so much time is taken up with these tasks that don't make money and it's irritating. And I know that I'm missing deals if I'm being distracted, you know, like uh, I can't get on. I, sometimes I'll miss a call and I'll try and call that person back like five times. and just won't answer. It's like I, if I was just paying attention, I was free. I maybe could have got that call. That could have been 10 grand, right? 10 grand mm -hmm. right there. Instead, I'm trying to save, you know, a couple of hundred dollars here or there on hinges, right? Like, <laughs> uh, Alex, how old are you? I'm 32. 32. I'm on the older side. Luke is like 15. 
uh, it's crazy, man. These kids, like, holy smokes, they're young. Like, I got a buddy, uh, Bikram Dasanj. I think that guy is like 28 now or something. Uh -huh. And he's like absolutely crushing it. Like the kids that get stuck, and Mike Rosenhart, obviously, right? This guy's like mm -hmm. 21 years old or something. Like, what the hell? This guy's got like a billion properties and he's like rich, rich, rich. And he's like 21 years old. It's like remarkable. It's awesome. Yeah. So what do you think it is? Like, you know enough people, young people especially, why don't they do what you do? Uh, that's a great question. There's a myriad of factors. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't know, in my experience, I've always kind of, I wasn't as confident as I am now. I was pretty insecure when I was younger. And one of the ways I got confidence was through skateboarding. So skateboarding taught me a lot. Um, it made me confident in myself. It made me realize I could do things I could never imagine. And it teaches you to eat shit and get up and do it again. <laughs> Luke's turning 30 on Sunday. Oh man, I forgot, it's September, holy smokes. <laughs> um, and when you get, uh, when you get to the, that point in skating, y y you don't think about the hard stuff anymore. You don't think about getting hurt. You don't think about how frustrating it is to try a million times and get one right in that million tries. You mm -hmm. just knuckle down and get it done. And um, so that's what's called grit, right? That's passion and perseverance. And there's some studies on this. There's a really good TED talk on that in a book. You're laughing, right? You yeah. know this already. This is like not news. Yeah. Anyone wants yeah, to that's right. Google yeah. TED Talk uh, grit. Yeah, it's a great talk. And it's true. So again, I'm coming from the cognitive science um, and philosophy background. Uh, so you have my stamp of approval on that stuff. Um, grit and perseverance is that one thing that when you, and, and, and think of Grow Rich, they talk about this too, uh, burning desire, right? When you have that burning desire, um, and then you have the grit to see it through. Mm -hmm. um, I just remembered actually a thought I had. This was actually a turning point for me. I was listening to a Robert Kiyosaki audio thing, and he was talking about how he at one point had the million dollar Velcro business, and he wasn't keeping his eye on his business or his, his mind on his business or whatever, and wasn't watching the balance statements. And he went bankrupt, and he was in his car with his wife. And I remember thinking, because this was my old mindset, right? At the time, I was like, isn't that like a sign that you shouldn't be doing this? <laughs> like you, you went bankrupt. Like, how did that happen? You had a company that was producing money and then you went bankrupt. Like, you shouldn't be doing this. But he was just like, you know what? Um, this really sucks, but this is just sort of a, I know how to get rich, so I'm just going to make it happen again. Um, and I didn't quite understand that at the time. Now, going through what I've gone through, uh, you can't take failure as a reason to stop. Failure doesn't mean you're bad. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means, oh, here's something I now know. Don't make that same mistake again and operate a little bit more intelligently this time and more carefully. So uh, yeah, that that grit aspect is, is key. And I think too, that there's not really too many examples of people, which is again, why I, I give you kudos and, and also everyone else is doing um, you know podcasts is, you need to be an example for other people. You need to show some encouragement and kindness. And in, in my situation, my, my father wasn't really, my parents separated when I was really young, I was like four. And my mom was like pretty strong-willed and just always working and I was pretty much on my own. So I have two older brothers, they kind of raised me, but I didn't have that like strong, my, both my parents' dads died when they were very young. So they didn't have male role models. I'm not saying the key to success is having males, but I'm just saying in, in my case, I didn't have, like I'm a male, I didn't have that strong male father figure to show me you know, how to be tough and to, to make things happen, to carry your family and that kind of stuff. So I didn't have the encouragement, I didn't have the example, so I had to get it from other people, like you know, characters in movies or cartoons or whatever, as funny as that may sound, um, you know, from stories. And then later on, um, people like Kiyosaki and, and all the other big names, Tony Robbins and all these guys. And you just you hear this encouragement and this confidence. And um, this one guy that helped me out, too, was also into the personal development stuff. And he wasn't shy about it. My brothers are both engineers, so they poo poo that stuff. And I was also in the sciences and philosophy, so I kind of poo pooed it, too. But I'm still open minded. And he was an example for me. And I thought, damn, if he can do it, I can do it. Ben and, ben and Jerry's were also, they, they pissed me off. They're like these two hippies that are rich off of stupid ice cream names. Like, what the hell is that? How, they can't be smarter than me. What do they know I don't? And that was it. Just followed the personal development books, had some examples, and just uh, stuck with it. 
here you are. Yeah. Very cool. Alex, we're way over time. I don't know if you're. Are we? Oh my god. <laughs> oh <laughs> man, I ran our flu, much. didn't it? <laughs> it does. You have more questions? Should we try and jam them in? I, I try to honor our guest's time and sure. also for everyone else that wanted to be on this, to want to listen in. It is Angela Lee Duckworth, who yeah, uh, that's right. who did the TED Talk on grit, and yeah. it's actually interesting because, uh, like you said, your 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 skateboarding example actually plays right into our talk. Hmm. That was your extracurricular activity yeah. that taught you grit. Yeah, you had to keep repeating, repeating, practice, 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 attempt, 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 until you could get it, until you could get something done. And that way, you said that that was proof to you that that's what's required to get results in the future. Yeah, you require several attempts. You don't give up. You keep trying. You will get you will get your results. And there's also that element of faith because with real estate, you're not going to be guaranteed money as soon as you sign that contract. That's going to come later, hopefully. hopefully. <laughs> so with skateboarding, I'm rolling up to a ten stair. I'm about to flip a piece of wood and throw my body down it. I think I'm going to get it, but I don't know. But you got no choice. You got to do it. And sometimes it just works out. <laughs> so try to make it work out more often than not. But um, that's the same thing with real estate. You you gotta you gotta put the fire in first, and then you get the heat. You can't just talk to an empty stove, and you know it's not gonna heat you up. You gotta have the faith that it will come back. Awesome, Alex. It's been a blast. You're a, yeah, a, a dynamic young man. Really impressed. That you're almost, you're, you're 32. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. It's uh, interesting. It just just have the grit and uh, have some examples, talk to people and read some books and get some good information in your head, fill out that cup of water, right? And then just make some offers, get some deals done. Work with people like, like that you admire, Erwin. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure you've helped out a lot of people in the past that didn't know what to do and you partnered with them in some capacity to help them out. Like, that's a great way to get started. Just work with mm -hmm. someone who's experienced, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. they can teach you a lot, by osmosis even. It just sort of transfers over. So I wanna end with this. Okay. Any other bad thoughts you think people need to need to let go of? Because you see, like a because you use yourself as an example. You left your previous life as the bartender, and I'm sure you left a lot of people behind as well. Mm -hmm. What yeah. what what is the what are the bad thoughts that are holding them back? Or is I it they don't even have grit? I think or, I think there's also this a bad thought is that you are owed something. You have to have an attitude of service, you know, and the world is harsh. So sometimes people get mad at me because I'm like, you know what? Uh, I'm sorry that you have a bad situation, but you can either have your excuses or you can have your successes. You can't have both. And that's mm -hmm. a pretty common saying. It's like, I don't know what to tell you, man. I get it. You had a bad rap, but you got to make it happen or mm -hmm. you can be miserable. It's your choice. And people usually say, ah, it's reductionist. That's too simple. It's like, it, that's the answer. <laughs> you got to stop. We can sit here for three hours and talk about it, or I can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can send you along with on your way with the, with two sentences. Yeah. What would you prefer? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, People think uh, it's Alex, complicated. Yeah. It, 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 people think it is complicated, but I think it partly is complicated because it's it's these are you know the glass of water analogy that you started with. Hmm. It took them thirty years to fill that glass. Yeah. Yeah. So Great they point. don't necessarily want to empty that. Great point. It's right. very hard to, if I may, I'm sorry we're going over time, but there's another really great analogy. Again, Kiyosaki, sure. you know the monkey analogy, right? Mm, shoot, go ahead with it. So the analogy is poachers in the jungle, I don't even know where monkeys are. So the jungle, um, they will find a tree with a hole in it and they'll fill it with nuts because they know a monkey will go in there, grab the nuts, but it can't get its fist out, right? Because ah, the I hole see. is just small enough. So what that means is you can't really just fill your head with information. There's two parts to that. The other part is just letting go. Stop doing the things and believing the things that got you where you are because that's not going to help you get to where you need to go. You got to let go of that stuff. And you got to just, and that's what you said. That's, that's very hard. It's scary. It's hard to do. Mm -hmm. And it might be helpful to read some philosophy. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's mm -hmm. the secret. Mm -hmm. Maybe exercise your brain and think about things that are just unbelievable and how they're actually mm -hmm. very convincing. And then you read a right. counter to that and you're like, oh, that's even more convincing. And you just let go of stuff and fill your head with good stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I think of uh, one, one thing I always find that stops people is uh, they were taught that debt is bad. Yeah. And then, and then when I dig into it, it's usually often their parents or their grandparents went through 
uh, dep depressions or in, in hyperinflationary periods. That's right. So they think debt is bad just because if, if that happens again, yes. Oh yeah, if that happens, lots of people are ruined. Yep. Right. If interest rates spike up, and then but then you have to bring it back to reality and like what is the likelihood that's going to happen? And also, of course, um, having your buffers. So run your numbers at seven percent interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're probably going to get three or four, but run them at seven. If they work at seven, you're probably fine. Right. But you're paying, you're paying 10, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, temporarily. Um, hopefully going to get that get that replaced with something at around five or six. We'll see. Excellent, excellent. So Alex, if anyone wants to follow along with you, where where can they find you? Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter? I'm, you know what? Um, you can find me on Facebook under my personal name. So Alex Coromanis, A-L-E-X-K-O-U-R-A-M-A-N-I-S. Uh, my Instagram, I think, is Treetop Residential, but I'm not really on there too much. I, I'm I'm not I'm happy to reach out to anybody, and I'm happy to give information for free. But what's irritating is when people fall off the map, or they don't listen, or whatever. I'm not here to. I'm busy. Like I'll give you some whatever, but you know you gotta you gotta make some stuff happen. And mm -hmm. shoot me a question, or shoot me a message, and stay in touch. Come to the meetups too. So we got the meetup uh, Tria on. Is it meetup.com? Uh, TRIA yeah. is the Toronto Real Estate Investors Association. We have meetings. Um, it, oh man, it always gets moved around. I think it's Tuesdays or Wednesdays. I think it's Wednesdays. So, Black Lab Brewery in Toronto. Um, if you go look for Luke Boyerin or the TRIA meetup, um, Luke and I are there um, every month. And um, usually, the, the way to, to approach me or meet me is just to say, hey, you know, I heard the podcast or, or whatever. Um, uh, I have a question or, or, you know, something I'd like, like help with or whatever. And happy to chat with you then. No problem. Don't ask me to get coffee. That's kind of annoying. <laughs> coffee is $1.50. I can afford it. Um, but uh, you know, if you're going to be like, that's the thing. Here's a tip very quickly. If you show me that you want to make something happen and you're committed and you're going to come back and fail and come back again, I'll be there for you. I want to mentor, I mean, to some extent, um, and help people. Oh, Luke's posted it. That's great. I want to mentor and help people uh, along and give back because someone was there for me, like the encouragement, the example. But um, the coffee thing is just a waste of time. Nothing's going to get done and you're going to disappear. <laughs> Come to the meetups, show up regularly, show me that you're serious, and I'll, I'll be happy to spend time with you. And, and uh, I believe your next speaker is actually Tom Pobo, who's a friend of ours. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a cool dude. Yeah, he's a good guy. It's yeah. hilarious. It, it's it's funny because uh, I was talking. Someone's telling me, and they said they ran into Tom at a. Uh, I think it was at Luke's. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> at a wholesale property of his. <laughs> you know why? Because he's a smart guy. He's like, hey, these guys are wholesaling in the GTA. Probably want to be good friends with them. It's like, yeah. yeah. And he's a cool. He's a great. Uh, I haven't done a deal with him yet, but I'm looking to, forward to doing a deal with him soon. Excellent. Very good. All right. Very good. Uh, Alex, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. It was a pleasure.